a new sermon series uh, for the next seven weeks that will take us right actually into November, and it's simply titled Seven Holy Behaviors. We're going to talk about uh, maybe some tangible ways, although not overly specific in nature, that we can exhibit holy behavior. And I'll tell you, uh, uh, part of the inspiration for this uh, involves a story. It's the story of a a Christian who lived a long, 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 long time ago, a fellow by the name of Evagrius Ponticus. He lived in the 4th century, which is the 300s, kind of throughout the the, the majority of that century, actually. He was a really faithful and promising Christian. In fact, he had been a disciple of many of the prominent uh, teachers and leaders of the church of his day, folks like uh, Basil of Caesarea, Gregory of Nanziazas, not names, names that you would probably recognize or be familiar with, but they were kind of a big deal back then and to us today in, in theology. He was their student, and he was on the fast track actually to being a, uh, a significant church leader himself. But in his late 30s, he kind of did something that I, I don't think a lot of people expected. He left behind all of his promise, all of his prestige, this fast track to being a a leader in the church, and he traveled to Jerusalem, and he became a monk. And then after he became a monk, he went to Egypt, and he lived in the desert for the rest of his life in a small community of other monks. They were called the Desert Fathers, and they were a bunch of uh, uh, writers, and, uh, and, and what we call ascetics, people who gave up worldly pleasure, worldly pursuits. They lived uh, with very little in their possessions. They didn't have any material possessions. And they spent most of their time um, fasting and praying or um, uh, living out in very radical ways the teachings of Christ. And they certainly spent a lot of time just in, in silence, uh, meditating upon Scripture and even uh, meditating on spiritual matters. Some of them uh, even had uh, the majority of the psalms memorized by heart so that they could sing them every day in community. Uh, Not exactly the folks who are sitting at home watching Netflix, like we who might do so today. During his life and his time in the desert, and he didn't spend a whole lot of time in the desert because he went there as an old man, um, Evagrius... uh, engaged with God regularly, and one of the things that he reflected upon was sort of the nature of temptation and sin and virtue and grace. And it was near the end of his life, he actually compiled a list of what he called um, eight deadly thoughts, little temptation things that, that, he, that he argued were really behind every sin that one might commit. There was kind of like eight deadly thoughts, and one overarching thought, which was a love for the self and not for God or the neighbor. Very biblical idea. Well, a couple hundred years after Evagrius, um, a pope by the name of Gregory I took his list and he combined a couple of them and he added another one, changed some of the wording around, and and this is what we get. Uh, This is what we now have today as the, the seven deadly sins. Comes from a long time of reflecting in the desert. And I, I got to thinking about that, and I got to thinking about those, not just because it's, it's a temptation and sin, and we always must be analyzing and examining our own temptation and, and sin and the ways that God calls us to redemption, God calls us to holiness. Uh, but I also got to thinking about something that we often don't consider when we, when we think about sin, and that is God's grace and the opportunities God offers us actually to not sin ways that God calls us away from sin by choosing a different behavior, so to speak. And and so I want to spend the next seven weeks focusing on holy behaviors, holy ways that God calls us to be more like Christ. And and to do so, we're going to just look at at some very broad, very uh, uh, general uh, holy behaviors that we can obzib- exhibit and, and maybe receive an invitation from God to apply them into our lives the way that we need to do so. So the first text that we are going to use for our first holy behavior actually comes out of Proverbs fifteen eighteen. It's just one simple verse, and I invite you now just to hear the word of the Lord today from this proverb. 
the proverb writer writes, hotheads stir up conflict, but patient people calm down strife. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today we're going to talk about patience. Patience is a very holy behavior, and if you're like me, it can also be a very difficult behavior to have, or at least to have all the time. I want to really begin by telling you a, a, another story. This one, maybe not from so far back in church history, but, but actually back just a few years ago. I was working in a church. Um, yes, my, uh, my work in ministry does precede coming to this church. Uh, I've been working in ministry since about uh, 2011. Um, uh, so despite, uh, despite only the brief time that I've been here with you, I have served in other ministry contexts. And one of my favorite contexts I ever got to serve in, and it was a very, very brief time, was at a church. And I worked there under a pastor who was a friend and a, and a mentor and somebody who I call on for advice even to this day, a wonderful woman. Um, I was at this church, and I was working and uh, uh, doing some Wednesday night things there and um, uh, being mentored by this pastor, and, and I became aware of a, of a kind of an issue that was going on in the church. There was a fellow there who had very strong passions, very deeply held convictions, and probably most of all, very, uh, very strong opinions. And, and he was a, a fellow who I, I liked. I didn't know him very well, but I liked him. And, and actually, when it came to his opinions, I actually found them very agreeable. The problem was not his opinions, necessarily. It was the fact that he wanted the church to kind of follow his lead. He wanted the church to start doing certain things in the community that he felt very passionate about. He wanted the church to start uh, um, doing different things that they have never done before because he believed they were the right things to do and they needed to do them. And if they weren't doing them, they, they really weren't being the church. And as I said, to a certain extent, I actually agreed with the fella, at least in, in, in spirit. But as the pastor told him, and as I knew in my own heart, the church wasn't ready to do the things that he wanted to do. The church wasn't at a place together socially, spiritually, as a community to, to want to do the things that he wanted to do. And that's okay. Churches are where they are. And, and, and the pastor uh, communicated, to this, uh, communicated this to him uh, very regularly. She was very patient. She was very gracious. And, and she regularly was in contact having conversations with this fellow. But it, it didn't matter. He wanted it done now needed to be done now. And when she told him it couldn't be done now, he eventually stopped being so gracious himself. He began to gossip about her. He began to slander her. And at one point, he, he even um, sent out an email to the entire church slamming the pastor. Um, he, he didn't want reconciliation he didn't want to move on from the church. And eventually, eventually, he even tried to initiate a church split. And it failed. Um, the pastor was a, a, a good pastor and was beloved by the community. So by the grace of God, it failed. And even after that, he, he chose not to just kind of accept it or to move on. He stayed for about another year. And I believe now he's, he's finally moved on. But, but really put... Um, this pastor through quite the ringer, and more importantly, it really caused the pain, or it really caused the church a lot of pain, really wounded the church. Uh, by the grace of God, they are still doing quite well today, but it was a very torturing episode. Right off the bat, we can talk about how we all suffer from impatience at some point in our lives, right? In fact, it's a cultural thing. I would, I would argue that impatience is one of the few things that I think culturally speaking, our world actually is well aware of its lack of, its lack of patience. Uh, if you look at popular music today, or popular music of even the last few decades, you realize that many popular artists actually sing songs about their frustration with being patient their desire to be patient and their inability to do so in certain situations, especially when it comes to romantic love. 
Take, for instance, the Beach Boys, who once sang, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we were older? A song of lament about love that was young and was forced really to wait until marriage. Or, or take, for instance, the late Tom Petty, who once confessed in a song that when it comes to his desire to see his dreams and the things that he wants to become reality, the waiting is the hardest part. And even the often dysfunctional band, Guns N' Roses, are aware of the power of patience, the power of impatience, and they even crooned desperately once, all we need is just a little patience. And even though that particular song was about a rocky relationship, the, the lead singer Axl Rose actually acknowledged in a 1989 interview that there was actually more to the song than that. He said, one, of, one reason the song was written was about needing patience and about having a lack of it. I don't have any patience now. Same way, basically, for everybody else in the band. It, it just depresses us because we go, man, we thought we were getting closer to finding some peace of mind. We're further from it than we've ever been, or at least that's the way it seems. Now, I don't know about you, and I don't know about your preferences about popular music, but I can certainly identify with that sentiment. There's been many occasions in my life where impatience has led to frustration, it's led to dissatisfaction, it's led to anxiety, and it's even led to anger. What about you? Have you ever struggled to be satisfied? Have you ever struggled to have a peace of mind all because it required maybe a little bit more waiting, a little bit more patience than you were willing to give at that time? Interestingly enough, if we surveyed all of Scripture, we would actually find that, that a, a word for patience is only used about 15 times in the Old Testament and 14 times in the New Testament. And in the Old Testament, when that word is used, uh, most of the time it actually refers to God's patience, oftentimes through the phrase slowness to anger. Patience in the Old Testament is understood as slowness, or, or sometimes the word there is used actually to describe large things, like large wings, the large wings of an eagle, for instance. The Hebrews understood patience as something that was very long, a long road to walk, and very slow in walking that road. In the New Testament, patience is also held up a little bit more like a, like a virtue, like we understand it today, but it's also used at times uh, when the early church was facing um, challenging issues. For instance, the Apostle Paul wrote in Colossians 1, 11, he, he implores the believers to be strengthened through the Lord's glorious might so that you endure everything and have patience. Likewise, in, in James 5, 8, the writer proclaims, you also must wait patiently, strengthening your resolve, because the coming of the Lord is near. But even if we acknowledge the fact that patience is kind of referenced in Scripture, we, we really do much better to notice how patience is actually part of the overarching theme of God's story of redeeming us. Remember that Abraham had to wait a few decades to see God's promise of a child fulfilled before him. Uh, remember how uh, uh, the, the liberated Israelites, after spending 400 years in captivity in Egypt, then had to wander for four decades in the wilderness in order to get to the promised land. Or, or we think about uh, how, how the shepherd, David, is anointed for kingship in his early teens, but it's not until he hits the age of 30 that he actually becomes the king that he was anointed to be. And oh, by the way, between that time, his predecessor, King Saul, actually tried to kill him a few times too. Talk about patience under fire. Or maybe we think of the prophet Jeremiah who assures Israel that God will eventually bring them out of exile and back to the promised land saying, I know the plans I have in mind for you, declares the Lord. They are plans for peace, not disaster, to give you a future filled with hope. What I'm trying to say to you, friends, is patience is not only a part of our story, it's actually a pretty overarching command from Scripture. Be patient and know that better times will come. Be patient and know that God will provide. Be patient and 
because God's been patient with you more times than not. In fact, if we were following the lectionary for today, one of the texts actually comes out of uh, uh, Exodus where, where God has finally had it up to here with the Israelites. And he tells Moses, um, uh, start picking out names for the new people you want because I'm about to wipe these, this people out. And Moses' his message to the Lord is, no, just give them more time. Be more patient with them. And God finally decides, all right, I'll be more patient with them. Because when we are impatient, God is indeed gracious and slow to anger, even though we sometimes still suffer from it. Now, the reason that patience is so important is not just because God is patient with us and it's a behavior we need to exhibit because God exhibit it, exhibits it to us and, and whenever God exhibits a behavior towards us, we must go and do likewise. Part of loving God and loving your neighbor is actually being Christ-like to your neighbor. But there is also another reason why patience is important, and it has to do with the reality of both temptation and sin. You see, impatience is directly related to two very common and very powerful emotional responses. Anger and anxiety. Those are two emotional responses that I can identify within my own life. I can be very uh, high-wired for, for anxiety. I can be somebody who can, who can get angry at, at things or dissatisfied with things. Not, not like that. I'm not a, 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 a you know, a, just a powdered keg of, 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 of anger that just gets set off with just the littlest thing. But certainly, my threshold for patience is much shorter at times than I want it to be. This is perhaps why uh, the writer of Proverbs here in 1518 uh, begins this proverbial wisdom by talking about the anger part. He says that the hot-headed person, the person who is not patient, the person who does not wait, the person who is not slow to anger, is one who causes discord, bickering, Quarrels, the different words we could describe this word here to, to describe conflict or strife. Perhaps you can recall a time in your life where, where somebody's impatience, somebody else's, your own, somebody close to you, somebody's impatience actually caused an unnecessary conflict. You know, the kind that goes beyond just simply people's feelings were hurt. We're talking about, man, this thing went from zero to a hundred really quickly. Man, this, this issue got exacerbated, and it didn't really need to be. Man, this, this little molehill, which we have outside, by the way, go take a look, has become a mountain. And it's because impatience is oftentimes connected to anger. In fact, in my ministry, I have found that this particular dynamic of impatience is, is one that not only is common to people around the world, but it's, it's also common within the church, and it's also one of the biggest threats that the church faces. In a world today where the church is adapting a little bit more to meet the needs of the world, to, to be able to engage with people who maybe have never been engaged with before, or, or really to try to reach out and grab and touch the people who have walked away from the church. It, it takes a lot of adaptability, a lot of flexibility, and most of all, a lot of trust in God's leadership of us. It, it's, it's a long road, and it's a slow journey. And how many people I have seen over just my first decade in ministry who do not want to walk that road because it's too slow who do not want to travel on it because it's too long, who trust in God until patience runs out. And then it is much easier, much better, and at least for the moment's sake, much more satisfying to lash out in anger, to tell people exactly what you think about situations, to tell, to tell people exactly what they're doing wrong, in your opinion, to tell people what they need to be doing in order to be right. It's a common problem. It's a problem that's affected our church and it's affected every church I've ever been a part of. And it's one that needs to change. Uh, something that we all need to do every single day, 
as we pray to the Lord is pray for God's patience to be upon us because patience saves us from sinking down into a quicksand of anger, a a kind of anger that may explode at first but will eventually consume us and will eventually leave destruction in its wake. There are many more examples I could talk about that I, I will choose not to this morning of how anger has destroyed communities, destroyed churches, destroyed people who otherwise loved one another. So that's, that's a first reason, that's a first emotion that impatience is connected to, but there's another one as well, and it's the emotion of anxiety. In fact, anger and anxiety are, are kind of related themselves. Now, we, we should say that, um, you know, there is, there, there is such a thing as a, sort of a clinical uh, issue of anxiety, and people have to take medication for it. And, and we're not talking about all anxiety everywhere, but merely anxiety that is uh, uh, perhaps unwarranted. The kind of anxiety that maybe, maybe we could exert a little bit more control over. Uh, let me give you an example. It, it's the kind of anxiety that exists and that is concerned with, what am I going to eat tonight? What am I going to wear tomorrow? How am I going to function the next day? And interestingly enough, Jesus talks about this, doesn't he? In Matthew chapter 6, the Sermon on the Mount, he tells people not to worry. Don't be anxious about these things. Don't worry about what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat. Trust in the provision that God has. I mean, come on, folks. Look at the world around you. Do you think the plants of this earth worry about where they're going to get their provision from? Do you think the birds of the air or any living creature on the ground is concerned about what it's going to get? If God provides for all of these, won't God provide for you too? That's the kind of anxiety we're talking about. It's directly related to impatience because we sometimes fall into this trap, and I am no different, friends, of saying to ourselves, If we don't do this now, the moment will pass and we will not be able to do it again. If we don't start doing this now, there will come a time where we cannot do it. And you know what? There may be some truth in that. But my fear is that we do it too often. My mother is a, an example of this, and my mother is a, is a wonderful saint. I'm in ministry today because of my mother, but she's also a coupon fiend. If we don't get this now, it won't be at that price later on, but we don't need it now. Well, if we don't get it now, we'll have to pay, for, uh, pay more for it later. If we don't get this thing now, we won't have it, or if we don't keep this thing, there may come a time when we need it, and then we won't have it. That kind of anxiety that leads us to do things impatiently, that leads us to rely upon our own ability to provide for one another. And I'm sure, based on the grins I see, that that's hitting close to home to some of you. It also does to me. This is not personal. Um, this, is, this is probably more personal for myself. I'm sure uh, Alexandra, who is down, uh, I believe, in the children's area, who is listening to this right now, is probably laughing to herself that I'm telling you this. But anxiety causes us to be impatient primarily because anxiety prevents us from living in the present. Um, somewhere in the last few decades of, of the church's history, we've, we've almost villainized or vilified um, this idea of living for the moment because we got to worry about where we're going to be in eternity. And there's, there is some truth to that. But friends, I'm here to tell you today that God doesn't want you living in the past. God also doesn't want you living in the future either. God doesn't want you worried about the future. God wants you to be concerned with right now. Not concerned in that you must be fretting, you must be worried, you must be impatient right now, but you must be concerned with the God who is present with you right now. In in 1942, uh, the Christian writer C.S. Lewis, who many of you I'm sure are familiar with, Uh, He wrote such great works like Mere Christianity, uh, The Great Divorce, and probably more for for everyone, uh, our favorite little fantasy, uh, The Chronicles of Narnia. World War II is in full swing, and he and some of his pals, including the author of Lord of the Rings, J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, would meet, and they would write, and they would discuss things, and they would would sort of deal 
with the trauma that the war was bringing. The, the carnage of World War II was unprecedented at that point. We're talking millions and millions of lives lost all around the world. And, and in this time, he was writing to, uh, he, he, was, he was writing sort of a work to Christians who were maybe angry at God for allowing the war to go on or who were feeling very, very anxious about the war. And he wrote this book called The Screwtape Letters. And, and it's, a, it's kind of a fantasy, uh, uh, but almost like reality book that he wrote. And it, it features two characters, a, a, a sort of executive demon who is, who is like the head of like the temptation department. And his name is Screwtape, and he's writing to his nephew. His nephew's name is Wormwood, and he's kind of a lower-level tempter. He's more of the -the boots-on-the-ground guy. And they're corresponding back and forth because Wormwood is is kind of inexperienced, and he's working on this British fellow who's living in World War II, and he's trying trying so hard to, to determine if he can have faith in God. And Wormwood is just so desperately trying to lure him away from faith. Uh, from trusting in God, and, and it's a book that's just letters and letters of, of screw tape writing to Wormwood and talking about here's different ways that you can destroy people's lives so that they turn away from God. Here's different ways that you can prey upon them, their vulnerabilities, their weaknesses, their insecurities, and here's how you can terrorize them to bring them to God. And in chapter 15 of that work, he writes to Wormwood and says, you know, Fear, both fear and, and constant pride are often very good ways of getting people away from God. He, he talks to Wormwood about preying upon their impatience, about preying upon people's impatience to see the war come to an end, to see all of this carnage end, to see peace or some semblance of peace finally return to the world and to prey upon their impatience, their desire to see it now in order to draw them away from God. And in the process of it, uh, this demon screw tape says, reveals to Wormwood um, something about God. He says, you know, God's ideal is for people to live in the present. We need to. We need them to, to get thinking about the past and the future. We need them to be anxious about the future. We need them to be angry about the past. We need them to be angry about what's happening right now because that's exactly what God doesn't want them to be. He says to Wormwood that God's ideal is for a person who having worked all day for the good of all people in the time to come is able to wash his mind of the whole subject, commit the issue to heaven, and return at once to the patience or gratitude demanded by the moment that is passing over him. Friends, the reason that patience is a necessary holy behavior is because if we are impatient, we are not living in this moment with God. And what God desires for us to do is to live for today. Tomorrow will bring its own issues. We all know this. I've got a schedule. I know what's coming. But I I, I cannot be anxious about those things. And on the other side of things, I, I, I don't know what the future will hold for the church. I I... I... I sometimes will find myself, and, and actually more frequently, I will, I will actually wake up in the middle of the night, and for a, the better part of an hour, I will lay awake in intense anxiety and, 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 in a sense, intense anger, thinking about whether the church in, in our world, the church in the United States, uh, will survive the next century when there are so many challenges, when there are so many problems, when there doesn't seem to be enough workers in it. And I lay awake at night praying to God, trying to communicate to God that I trust in God, but knowing, knowing within myself that I don't have the patience at that moment to simply live in the moment, the patience to have the peace to even go back to sleep. What God calls us to do today, friends, is to be patient and not to uh, bury in the sand or not acknowledge the issues and the challenges that we have. It's it's good to acknowledge them, The, the, the issues within our church, the issues within our community, the issues within the global church and the entire world. Yes, 
yes, we need to talk about them. But if we don't have patience when we talk about them, and if we don't have patience when it comes to how we deal with them, our anger for where we are at, our anxiety for the future that we cannot know, and our trust in God and in one another is liable to implode upon itself. It's a scary thing. It's the reason why popular music artists sing about patience. It's the reason why people hurt their own communities because patience is difficult. But I'm here to tell you this morning that God is ready and able to equip us with patience. There are simple things that we can do every single day to become people who are patient in our whole lives even. One thing that we can do is pray to God for patience. Add to your prayer list the desire for patience. Not just that you will trust in God, not that you, not that you will just have faith or that you will grow in faith, not, that, not that, uh, uh, that God would simply do work in your life and in the lives of people who need it, but pray specifically that God would give you patience. You can't acquire patience merely on your own. To do so implies that that activity is away from God. You need God to have patience. You need to pray to God for patience in your lives when you're feeling that urge to be angry or anxious because you're not satisfied with something that's going on. And rather than go to people to accuse them of something or rather than get angry with your community, it's better to just count to 10. And in counting to 10, say, God, I trust in you. Help me be patient now. Now, certainly there are times when patience run out. I, I, I don't mean for you to be a punching bag in any situation. But, but another thing that we can do is, is acknowledge that there is a difference between desperation and impatience. I'll give you an example. Somebody who hasn't eaten for three days is desperate for food. Somebody who's been waiting a half an hour at the restaurant uh, and has been hassling the waiter about where their food is, 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 or when their food is coming is not desperate. They're just impatient doesn't mean you don't have a gripe, but be patient. Acknowledge the fact that God has blessed you, that God has provided for you throughout your entire life, and if God has done it now, won't God do it in the future? Be patient. And finally, friends, something that we can all do to help continue this work of patience and the need for us to be patient is to gather with one another and to talk about the dreams that we have, to talk about the desires of our heart that we want God to realize, not because in doing so we're able to, to conjure it up out of thin air, but because in doing all of this, we exhibit a very, very, very holy attitude, an attitude of satisfaction for who we are today and for our ability to dream today and satisfaction that God is indeed working in our hearts, giving us these dreams, giving us these desires. I have dreams for this church and desires for this church. But I would be wrong to sit here before you and to say we need to do this right now. Rather, what God calls me to do before you as your pastor is to say, let us be present with the Lord in this hour and let us let the Lord lead us. Let us let the Lord prepare the way for us. Let us let the Lord who is slow to anger when it comes to the junk that we do, the ways that we harm things, the ways that we screw up, let that God be gracious to us now. Because in doing so, we will grow to be patient like he is. We will grow to be wise as he is wise. And with the good fortune of our Lord, and like our predecessors in our story, Abraham, the Israelites, King David, indeed all of God's people, we will find our way forward. All we need, as the less than saintly Axel Rose would say, is just a little patience.